This is a free country. If a 25-year-old man wants to live life pretending to be a woman, that's their right. What you don't have a right to do is make me pay for it. You don't have a right to ram it down my kids' throats. And you don't have a right to demand that the rest of society live and change all of our rules on the basis of, of something that isn't true. All right, everyone. Welcome back to this bonus edition of the Loopcast. Today, I am joined by the senator from the great state of Florida, Marco Rubio. Senator Rubio, thank you for joining. Thanks for having me on. Of course, it's an honor. So the first thing, I wanted to start at the beginning, if we could. Congratulations on winning another term. And what we saw happen in Florida seemed a lot different than what we saw happen across the country. Uh, and a question I wanted to have for you to start off with you, why do you think the message that Florida Republicans gave to the state ended up with so much success while maybe Republicans faltered in the 2022 midterm elections? Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, I think Florida, you know, there used to be a time we would say Florida looks like the rest of the country. Florida has changed a lot. A lot of people have moved here from other places, primarily because they don't like living in a San Francisco where the streets are unwalkable or we're living in places where, frankly, lunacy has taken over public policy. I'm not talking about differences of opinion because we've also had, we've always had liberals and conservatives and left and right. These are just things that make no sense, right? On nonsensical things like we're not going to arrest criminals, but we're going to really crack down on parents complaining at school boards. So a lot of people are leaving these places and that's always been happening for a while to Florida for a lot of other reasons. And that just accelerated with COVID and with this insanity in politics. And then the second, which I think is really more of a national trend that in Florida has been pronounced, is what's happening with working class voters. The biggest divide in America today is not ideological or ethnic or racial or even gender based. The biggest difference is between, you know, people that work for a living, you know, people that take a shower after work and people that take a shower before work. You know, the people <laughs> that take a shower after work that work with their hands or working class people and so forth. I think they feel abandoned by the Democratic Party. I think they feel abandoned by the left. And, and I think that doesn't know ethnic or racial boundaries. So if you talk to working class Cuban American or Colombian American voters, their views on a lot of these issues are largely indistinguishable from what you would find from a working class voter in Missouri or Iowa or somewhere else. And that trend has also accelerated over the last six years. So it's the combination of those two things, you know, a, a sort of a block of voters that historically were at least, you know, more of a swingy vote. Um, and then the third, and, and, and then obviously the people moving in. And then the third, frankly, is um, the performance. I mean, people are happy with the governor. I mean, there was no one that was going to be Governor DeSantis last year. And look, I've now been in office for, you know, two terms as I ran for re-election. I had people have a record. We've helped a lot of people. We, I was, uh, a couple, two nonpartisan groups ranked me as the most effective senator in terms of getting important things done for the country and for the state. And so I think there comes a point at which people vote for you because they think you're doing a good job. And so I think that was part of a, a factor here as well. So it, it's hard to sort of extrapolate that on Wisconsin or somewhere else, but, uh, right. but I think those were big parts of it. But, but that's an interesting point you made there too, because I think that media outlets really want to make you believe that the biggest divide in this country are race, uh, sexual orientation. They're just finding new intersections to divide people. But talking to you, it sounds like People, working class people aren't concerned with that. What would you say when you talk to your constituents are their top priorities for government? Well, I mean, in terms of government, I mean, their top priorities, I, I all both chop this in the, in, the, in the realm of normal and common sense. I mean, there's just things that make sense because they've always worked because, um, you know, the sun always rises in the east, no matter how many. And, and now they're asking us to pretend, well, sometimes it can rise in the west. Sometimes it doesn't rise at all. And that's what's happening in public policy. So on issue after issue every single day, people are being told that, for example, it's normal for thousands of people a day to cross the border of the United States. And if you don't agree with me, then you're, you're a xenophobe. Well, how can I be a xenophobe? My last name's Rubio. My parents were immigrants. I've always supported immigration. What I don't support is 11,000 people a day crossing the border in, in total chaos. I mean, I, I'm not a supporter of mass migration. Um, and, and so I think that that's one of the things that concerns people because of common sense, because it's their hospitals that are overcrowded. It's their schools that are overcrowded. It's their cities and towns that are overcrowded. You know, when these people cross the border and then they go out, they go to these communities where their relatives live and where they have a support network of family and friends. They don't go to Beverly Hills. They don't go to the Upper East Side. Or go, I guess now with the buses, a few of them do. But, you know, they don't go to Northern Virginia. They don't go to these places these enclaves around the country where people live in gated communities with armed guards and, and live fantasy lives. So I think that's a big concern on people's minds. I think the cost of living 
this whole notion of we got to save the planet. I, who wants to be, who's in favor? I'm not in favor of destroying the planet. I love the outdoors. I love nature. I've, no one's been a bigger supporter of the Florida Everglades as an example. But I know this, if we basically force this country to transition to so-called clean energy that doesn't exist right now, or you're going to bankrupt people. Like most people can't afford an electric car. Okay. Most people can't afford some of the things that these you know, pay $5 for a gallon of gasoline and so forth. So these are everyday things that people care about that, that, are, that are being applied to them. They want to feel safe. They want to feel secure, uh, both financially and physically. They want their kids to be given the chance to do all the things they themselves never got a chance to do. And they want our schools to empower them to do that. That's what they want our schools to do. And, um, and, and, and I think that really has become really pronounced. But, but uh, under the long answer, I probably owe you a better, more concise one. Let me just let me rub it down to this. At the end of the Cold War, we basically were governed in both parties by people who said, history is over. From now on, we're all going to be members of this global economic community. Um, it, do, it won't matter where things are made because we're all part of this global economy. It's called globalization. And a lot of people got hurt by that. Some people got very rich off of that. And those people are very happy with that system. But a lot of people got left behind. If you were the worker at a factory or at some business that suddenly just vanished, uh, you didn't just get up and move to Silicon Valley and learn to write code. You got left behind. And, and now there's the sense that after 30 years of doing that, it left our country vulnerable. But it left a lot of people behind and upset and angry, and it's manifesting in our politics. And it's causing people that have voted for Democrats for 30 years because of unions or what have you to say, I'm not voting for those guys anymore because they don't care about people like me. And on top of that, they're trying to change all the rules that govern society for some agenda that's supported by a small group of powerful elites uh, who want to ram everything down our throat. Yeah. And, and I actually have a few questions for you right now, but starting with this. So uh, the so, so-called so don't say gay bill really stirred up a lot of controversy in Florida, specifically with Governor DeSantis uh, revoking privileges to Disney over this. And when you talk about a small group of people that have an agenda, it really felt like teaching sexual education to kindergarten through third grade felt like a bridge too far for, for many people. Uh, right. Do you think that this feud between Disney and Governor DeSantis and what's going on in Florida was justified? The, the feud or the whole issue? I'd, I'd that, say there's, there's, two set, there's two separate things here. So Disney is his own government, right? They are their own government. They have their own fire, their own police. They don't have an elected board. They have an appointed board that govern them. They did their own land use, zoning, permitting, et cetera. I think that that is valid. That was created by the state legislature in the 1960s. And it's perfectly valid to go back and reexamine that. Why should some private corporation have its own government? If it's justified, they should go up and win. But elected people said that shouldn't be the case. Um, and they're the only ones that have it, at least at that level. Separate from that issue is Disney. Look, what happened with Disney is this. They have all these people that live in California that are their writers, employees, and the like, and they forced the company to opine. But my issue is not that they had an opinion about the Florida law. My issue is that they're lying about the Florida law. The Florida law is very simple. It's been changed now. But even today, it's very simple. Here's what it says. You can't use schools to sort of go and teach kids. You, you might be gay. Uh, you don't know. It's something you should think about. And um, you, might, uh, you might not be a boy. You might be a girl. That's a choice that you make. And uh, look, this is a free country. If a 25-year-old man wants to live life pretending to be a woman, that's their right. What you don't have a right to do is make me pay for it. You don't have a right to ram it down my kids' throats. And you don't have a right to demand that the rest of society live and change all of our rules on the basis of, of something that isn't true. And, um, and, and that really is what the pushback is again. But, the, but then you get into this, no pun intended, this loop, right, of, of how they build it up. So that, that law is put in place. Then advocates who are against it lie. And then the media makes it sound like somehow our schools are not simply not teaching these things, but are actually teaching kids to hate gay people or hate trans people. That, it's just saying you can't talk about this stuff. By the way, if tomorrow they said we want to have heterosexual month and we want to ram that down people's throats, I'd say, look, I don't want my schools talking about that stuff. I want my kids. We're already far behind in math, science, and history. I mean, look at the recent test scores that were emerged. We don't have any time to spare on this social agenda. So people push back against it. And Disney, getting themselves engaged in this, they, they were lying. They were misleading people about what the law did. And so people said, well, why do we have this special benefit for a company that lies about public policy in Florida? And when they examined it, they felt it was no longer justified. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I agree with all that, and especially as I know that you're Catholic and Catholic social teaching 
uh, is heavily involved in this, but specifically, uh, you have some policies that you support that are considered pro-family policies. And some people might criticize that as, well, you're engaging the federal government. That's big government. I thought you were, you know, conservatives are about less government or whatever. How would you answer someone when you talk about pro-family policies, how that right. would say benefit the common good? Well, a couple of things. First of all, I'm not, we're not talking about a law that basically says you must have more children, you must get married. It doesn't tell you what you should do. It's entirely incentive-based. Here's what I mean. We have public policy in this country. Okay, we're not anarchists. I am a conservative. I believe in limited government, but I'm not an anarchist. We have laws, we have rules, we have regulations, we have taxes. And all of it uh, has an impact on family and family life. It's either a disincentive to family life or it's an incentive to family life. And so my view is we should have, if, if indeed, as I believe, Family is the most important institution in all of society. And I say that because if family breaks down, nothing else works. I don't care how much money you spend in your schools. I don't care how many laws you pass. I don't care how many police officers you hire. If family breaks down, nothing else works in a society. So it's the most important element in our society. Government can't run families and they can't force you to have families. But what it can do is it can have public policies that, that we make sure none of them are anti-family and to the extent possible, are supportive of families. And so that's my view of it. The co it is in the common good that we have strong families, and all of our laws should be pro-family laws. We can't force anyone to start a family. We can't force anyone to have children. But if you choose to, our laws should be beneficial to you, not harmful. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of anti-family, uh, specifically in the military, it seems like there's been this effort to subvert the Hyde Amendment, to use government funds, taxpayer funds, to support... Uh, busing people around to get abortions in different states where you can do so. And we've seen Senator Tuberville kind of, Senator Tuberville rather, take a stand on that and say, hey, right. this isn't right. I'm going to do what I can to make sure this isn't happening. Uh, right. Do you support his methodology in doing do. so and freezing appointments? And uh, what would you say is the solution to get the military to follow the law? Well, let me just say if this was in reverse, if this was a Democratic senator that was holding up Trump nominations to the Pentagon, for abortion access, that person would be a hero. That person would probably be the Time Magazine Person of the Year. <laughs> that person would have been invited to the Met Gala. This person would have had a you know five part spread in Vogue, and they would have been the subject of a CNN three part series on how a row it been. Okay, so that's a fact. The second thing I would say is one of the things that I think has unified Americans for a long time, irrespective of their views of what our law should be about abortion, is that the federal government shouldn't be paying for it. That's what this is. Federal Pentagon money, that's federal money. And when you use money to put someone in a bus and evade the laws of states and go to other states to pay for abortions, um, that, that is federal money that's being spent. And so they, they, they are trying to circumvent what's long been an established um, consensus in this country uh, that, that even Democrats like Bill Clinton lots of support. Now, the Democratic Party looks very different today than it did just 20 years ago, even on this issue. I mean, it's hard to believe, but there was a time when a Democratic president said he wanted to be, he wanted abortion to be rare, but but legal, but safe and rare, but rare. You don't hear that anymore. So I support what he's doing because it's the only leverage point we have with an administration that w feels like they can do on this issue, whatever they want, with zero accountability from the media or anybody else. Yeah. And that reminds me, too, of uh, accountability. So Jim Jordan has been in charge of this oversight committee. Uh, or kind of exposing the weaponization of government. And I think one of the biggest issues that we focused on here at Catholic Vote is uh, the FBI potentially, or actually admittedly, at least one agent was embedded in a Catholic church, not just right. the radical traditionalist Catholics, but actually across the country, this has really gotten to be a big issue. As a Catholic yourself, did you take that really personally? And what do you see as the way forward here? Yeah, I did. A couple of things. Actually, they were very interested in uh at what, when they were allowed to, you know, parishes that were doing Latin masses. Now you have to do it at, in most places, you have to do it at a non parish church. But they were very focused on people that were tying into this Latin uh, mass communities, uh, of which I've attended a few here and that. It's a whole topic for another day, a very fascinating liturgy. And I'm not yep. anti Vatican too, but at the same time, you know, <laughs> I certainly see the value of tradition. And it's amazing when you go to these Latin masses, you know, the percentage of young people there is extraordinary. I mean, there's yep. something that calling people back to, uh, the power of that liturgy. Now, going back to the question, they were saying, somebody had said to them, hey, this is a, th these Latin masses are, are look to be like a place where a lot of weirdos gravitate and they go there to plot crazy things, whatever it is they think. So let's embed ourselves in that church. Now, I want you to take out for a moment the idea that that's a Catholic church and instead say that was a, uh, a mosque um, 
or a, a Buddhist temple or you name it, some other religious minority in the country, there'd be complete outrage in the country about it. So I think the FBI itself has sort of disavowed it. And basically, most of the field offices around the country, FBI agents aren't out to get people per se. I think most of our problems that exist come from the DC and, and the central office of the FBI. But I think it tells you the culture and the power that exists within some circles of the federal government that we will define extremists as anyone we don't like. And once you've defined someone as an extremist, then I think that that uh, justifies the use of government power uh, to monitor them, to crack down on them, to make life hard on them. And, um, and I think this was evidence of that. And, um, and it's something we have to be very, very vigilant about in the years to come. Yeah. And that really reminds me too, uh, Trump was just on the CNN town hall and the reaction from media outlets and media personalities was like democracy had died because a former president had been on television speaking. Uh, and then we've, all, we've also seen disinformation boards. We've seen so many attempts to control media. Um, do you, do you think that the, the way forward on that is free speech platforms like Twitter? How, how do you ensure that Americans keep their first amendment right to express their ideas freely? Well, I think the, following the constitution and have judge, making sure we have judges that understand that the first amendment, look, the first amendment, it, it is true. It's not completely unlimited. You can't use free speech. Like the example that was always given historically, it's screaming fire in a crowded movie house that creates a stampede. So you can regulate speech, time and place and manner, the way you do it, where you do it, when you do it. What you can't regulate is what people say. Free speech means that people get to say things that I find to be offensive and outrageous. People do it all the time. Listen, there are satanic clubs. There was a satanic convention recently. You go on Apple uh, Music right now, and they have an entire section. I forgot what the name of the sub uh, music genre is, but when you open it up, it's basically satanic music. I mean, it's bands that is claimed to be Satanist and the like. I'm not saying there needs to be a federal law to ban that to stop it. I'm not a Satanist. I'm obviously anti-Satanist <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. But but I acknowledge that to live in a free society where I have a right to worship as I please means people have a right to worship the way they please. So long, obviously, as it doesn't lead to violence or, or things that violate each other's rights. You, and it's hard to, for people to accept that. So we, we've reached a point now, and you've really seen it on the left, but you've seen it in academia, is speech is violence. And so there's certain speech that can't even be allowed. We can't even allow the speech because to allow the speech is, is uh, something needs to be cracked down on. Well, once you've made the determination that some speech should not be allowable because it's offensive, because it bothers you, someone has to make that decision. Someone has to decide what's allowable and what isn't. And, um, and where do they stop? And obviously, that, that's really the concern. So it, it, it is important for us to fight for this because if, if we allow the First Amendment to be redefined as you're allowed to speak freely as long as I agree with you, that's not free speech. But that becomes embedded in the way we, our culture, our society, and in some ways already is. There, there's movies Hollywood won't produce. There's stories the media won't cover. Uh, the, the, there are, there are uh, people that... Uh, that mainstream media and other entities and institutions in our society wouldn't celebrate already. So there's already a level of censorship happening at that level. But to have the power of government behind it, I think is a very dangerous thing. I think it's the beginning of the end of the republic if we ever reach that point. Yeah. And that also brings up another thing that you've really been kind of tip of the spear on. So uh, TikTok, it gets thrown around a lot. Gen Z yeah. loves it. Uh, the world loves it. But there is, uh, and if you go on Joe Rogan, he has a good section on this about how much data TikTok and the CCP collect on people. They've admitted to it. It's pretty open. The terms of service are kind of crazy. And they actually came before Congress, the CEO did, and said, you know, we're not doing anything other companies aren't doing. I know there's been this effort to potentially ban TikTok. Uh, do you have a suggestion? I know that uh, there's been some legislation passed, some controversy, or wanted to pass. How do we rein in the control that the CCP has over data of Americans without threatening the liberty and the freedom of American citi right. citizens. So, so a couple of things. First, let me put something off the table. I, I think there's a lot of crazy stuff on TikTok. One of the reasons why we're having this massive border catastrophe is there's these videos on TikTok telling people Biden has lifted the rules and everyone's allowed to go into the U.S. now. So a lot of disinformation that's going to have a real impact. But it's not the content, because if you got rid of TikTok, there's e equally crazy things being put up on Instagram and so forth. I mean, I think that's the job of parents and others to be vigilant about that stuff. Now. Let me say, putting that aside, the power of TikTok is not just the data they collect, it's what they do with the data. That data is fed into a recommender engine. It is basically the artificial intelligence that knows you better than yourself. And the more you use it, the more it knows about you. So it knows what you're going to want to buy before you even know you want. 
and and then knows the best messages that to, to reach you. That's a tremendous amount of power. Now that recommender engine, that that brain behind TikTok is owned by a company named ByteDance, which is a Chinese company. Under Chinese law, that company has to do whatever the Chinese government tells them to do. And that company can never sell that artificial intelligence, that recommender engine. That recommender engine only works if it's fed data. So I don't care who owns TikTok. I don't care if TikTok is sold tomorrow, tomorrow to 100% America. TikTok won't work unless it allows ByteDance in China to have access to that data constantly. And if you're giving it to ByteDance, you're giving it to the government of China. So what does it mean? It means that if today TikTok can be used to mislead migrants into believing that it's now legal to enter the United States uh, without a permit, if it can be used to convince young people that swallowing Tide Pods is a good idea, that's today, it can be used in the future to convince people that America is wrong and China's right, that we shouldn't invade Taiwan, um, that you know Catholic churches are out there teaching horrifying things that government needs to crack down on. Um, it can be used for all kinds of manipulation of our society that could create mass chaos, that could create mass division, that could basically eat us up from the inside out and weaken us. That can, in essence, allow China to win a war against America before a single shot is fired. And that's the capacity this gives them. And for us to allow that to be embedded in our society, not to mention the leverage it gives them over the small businesses that rely on TikTok, is insane. We should have stopped it a long time ago, but if we don't do it now, we'll never do it. And so do you believe the answer is to just ban TikTok from America? Why? Well, yeah, I have a bill that basically doesn't allow them to make money in America. So if they want to do this as a free service, but they can't make money, they can't monetize it. So I think that in, en in essence, and it doesn't, it does not, yes, it mentions TikTok and ByteDance, but the issue is not TikTok. The issue is that the engine that powers it will always be owned by a company subject to the Chinese Communist Party. And any company that has an algorithm like that, that is controlled by the Chinese Communist Party, and has, needs to have access to so much American data, should not be allowed to operate in the United States. So today it's TikTok, tomorrow might be somebody else. But absolutely, I, I just think that's the only solution. If there were an easier one, I would go for it. And by the way, I've been talking about this since 2019. So this is not a new issue for me. Uh, we should have done it back then. It would have been a lot easier. Yeah. And so immigration has come up a lot in this interview. And I, was, I, I want your thoughts because Title 42 recently expired. Uh, the House just passed a potential bill for some solutions, but it's not going to see the light of day in the Senate. Governor DeSantis just signed SB 1718 in an effort to crack down on illegal immigration in Florida. I know there's also been efforts to bust migrants different places. Um, it just seems like like a, a real mess here. And I think that one of the things that gets brought up is, well, Florida relies on illegal immigrants to do hard labor, manual labor, building uh, buildings, things like that. Um, do you think that uh, the charges against Florida for cracking down on illegal immigration in that way uh, are too harsh, are not justified? Or what do you see as the solution to help solve this problem here? Well, I understand why Florida is doing this because states are frustrated. They have no role to play in our immigration laws, but they have to deal with the consequences of it. Okay. But when, when a flood of immigrants that enter the country illegally, and I'm not talking about hundreds of people, I'm talking about tens of thousands of people come in, they're human beings. Most of them are decent people that want to work hard. Others are criminals because if you put like a thousand people from anywhere in a room, some of them are going to be bad people. I don't care who they are. Um, some are criminals. We have to pay for them to put them in jail and we have to deal with the consequences of their crime. People get sick. They have to go to our hospitals. People have to move around. They have to drive on our roads. Their kids have to go to school. Suddenly kids have to, schools have to absorb kids, kids in the middle of the year they didn't budget for. Um, we, states are facing the impact. They're frustrated and they're lashing out by trying to do these laws. But that's, that won't solve the problem. We can't, we're not 50 independent republics where, you, you know, we're, at the end of the day, we're, we're a country and people can move across lines. Here's the thing I tell people about immigration. I'm also a supporter of charity. We have all kinds of charity. We have a charitable group here run uh, by a Catholic organization called Camilla's House. It's a homeless shelter. And they take in people every night. But you can't just show up at the door. I mean, they say, okay, the doors are open from X to X time. We have capacity for 100 people, let's say. After we get to 100 people, the doors close for the night. That doesn't mean there aren't homeless people that wanted to get in that didn't get in, but, you know, they can only do so much. If we went in there and said, we demand that you allow anyone who wants to come in, come in, not only would Camilla's house have to house everybody in the community that wants to go in that night, but people would start coming down here and saying, hey, there's a place down there we can go. And suddenly right. a place that was built for 100 is now taking in 1,000. Is me saying that I want there to be a process by which we distribute charity 
anti-charity? No, it's just saying that at the end of the day, it has to be measured. That's true all across the board, even public charity, right? Medicaid, you still have to put paperwork that shows that you qualify for it. It can't just be right. here, I demand it. The same with immigration. I'm pro-immigration, but it has to be an orderly process. Our immigration process cannot be, you show up at the border, you ask for asylum, you're allowed into the country pending a hearing you'll never show up for. That, you're, you're, all you're going to do is serve as a magnet for 11,000 people a day to enter the country illegally. No country in the world can sustain that, not even the United States. This is chaos. This is not immigration. This is mass migration. It's chaos, and it's bad for everyone except cartels. And so why do we not have a, it's, it sounds like the answer is a federal solution, right? Because you said we're not 50 independent states here. We, we have right. a federal, we need a federal solution. Why have we not had a federal solution, even though this has been such a big problem over the past couple of years? Uh, because uh, if you say, okay, it starts with border security, there are some people that actually believe border security, at least elements of the left. This wasn't the case 10 years ago, but now the position of many in the Democratic Party because of the radical left is any immigration enforcement, any is xenophobic. That in essence, Anyone who shows up in the United States, we should, we should allow them in. We should allow them in. Um, and, and, and that's the position they've taken. And so now they can't b basically support any border measures other than what's cosmetic. And they insist on the legalization. They, they, when they, well, every time Biden or the White House says Congress needs to act, what they're talking about is some bill to legalize people that have been here illegally. Now, look, that idea is one that may at some point, something we may have to address. We tried to 15 years ago or 10 years ago. But that doesn't solve this problem. Dealing with the status of someone who's been here 15 years or 10 years does nothing to solve the problem of people who are going to show up today at the border. They're completely unrelated. If they are related, it is that when you pass a bill, every time that you're talking about creating some amnesty, it's misunderstood. In other parts of the world, people hear America is going to pass a law that legalizes illegal immigrants, and they say now's the time to go. So there's a lot of evidence to indicate that any debate over legalization would drive even more illegal immigration because people would misunderstand it and it would be misrepresented to them by trafficking networks. So the answer why is very simple. It is now the orthodoxy of the radical left that is the dominant uh, group in the Democratic Party that any immigration enforcement, any, is racist, xenophobic, and immoral. It's unfortunate. Uh, and I think we've got a lot of the hard questions out of the way here. So uh, I got some quick rapid fire fun ones here. So if you were not in politics, what would you be doing right now? <laughs> I'd, uh, I'd be hosting a, a podcast for the loop, I hope. Uh, <laughs> I'm not, not competing with you, but... Hey, don't take my job, come on. No, I, I don't know what I would be doing. I mean, I've always had an interest in public policy. There's two passions I've had in life in that and, and, and just the game of football, I'm just a fat fanatic of it. So I would think that, you know, maybe I would be, if I had ch chosen that career track, maybe I'd be like in the personnel department of some NFL franchise somewhere. Um, <laughs> but maybe the I'd Dolphins? Have, well, maybe, who knows? I mean, there's, 30, <laughs> there's only 32 to pick from if you're in the NFL. The problem is I'd be sitting there in the GM meetings, getting ready for the draft, watching Fox News or something and, and saying I should be in politics, you know? <laughs> so, um, you know, I think I am where I belong right now. And um, I don't know what God has planned for my future, but I certainly, you know, I never intended this to be, you know, plan to be there in the Senate in my 80s. So um, I'm 51, about to turn 52. So, you know, we'll see what the future holds, you know, but, uh, but I still think I find it to be meaningful and important and, and work that, you know, at an important time in our history that I have something to contribute. And I'm happy to be here now, but I, I don't know what I would be doing, but probably something football related. I well, hope anyway. Hey, I'm going to give you a chance to shine here. So yeah, the Dolphins got some big questions coming into the season. Uh, what, what did you think about the draft season? And do you think Tua is the guy? Is he going to lead you guys to the promised land? Well, I think Tua has the ability and he showed a lot. I think he finished the year with the highest quarterback rating in the NFL. He has to stay healthy, obviously. He had some unfortunate injuries last year, and uh, hopefully that's not a pattern. I think if he stays healthy, that's really the question. And I think they've got a guy that can execute an offense that they like. I mean, he's a, he really, I think of him more as a point guard than I do a, you know, a three-point shooter. I mean, this is a guy that knows how to distribute the ball to playmakers. They have a lot of those guys. And the draft, they didn't have a lot of picks. They lost one because they tampered, you know, so the NFL <laughs> took away uh, for them trying to go get Brady. or And, and then... Um, but And then they traded a lot of picks for Jalen Ramsey. They traded picks last year for Bradley Chubb. So I think you have to view it. Um, did, I think they gave up a four for, uh, or three for Jalen Ramsey. Was there anybody they would have picked in the third round that's better than Jalen Ramsey, who's a four-time All-Pro? The answer is no. Yeah. Is there anyone they could have drafted in the first round that would be better than Bradley Chubb? Who knows? But Bradley Chubb's been a pro bowler. So I think when you're in the, you know, you, you have these windows in the NFL because of the salary cap, you got to win Got our, the Rams are going through that now rebuilding. Yeah. And um, the Dolphins are kind of hitting up on that window right now. So 
you know, if you're, if you have a two-year window to win, then you do that with guys that are established. And I think that's the bet they've made. Yeah. I was raised in the Detroit area. So when I saw Matthew Stafford go out to the Rams, it was kind of like, I know I should be happy for this guy, but it almost feels like your ex-girlfriend. He's going to go win a Super Bowl. Yeah. yeah right. Your, ex, seen... your ex-girlfriend goes out and, you know, wins a Super Bowl. Yeah. And you're but like... The Lions are actually had a very good draft and, and you know, Dan Campbell was the interim coach of the Dolphins a number oh, really? of years ago. Yeah. He was a tight end coach that got promoted and and um and they've got you know they've settled on golf i think in the short term as their guy but they've got some pieces i got on, high, on i got high hopes i got high hopes so okay we'll put you on the spot uh two stays healthy what do you think yeah. the potential record is well record i don't know i mean they have a tough record the afc is stacked AFC i mean stacked. i think the afc record afc records are going to be a little different than nfc records this year because every team in the afc has a quarterback now in their division uh-huh. Uh, it's Aaron Rodgers and, and Josh Allen. I'm happy so, to get Aaron Rodgers out of the NFC, I'll tell you that much. Yeah, I know, I know. So, you know, it, it's going to be tough. But I do think that if you stack up just on paper, sort of if they perform to expectation, I think the Dolphins at this point are up there close to where the Bills are, I think, in some ways. Uh, the Chiefs obviously are the champs, and they've got um, some real capabilities there. So I think uh, the three best teams in the AFC, in my view right now, are, are the Chiefs, the Dolphins, the Bills, and um and, and maybe I mean, if they can stay healthy and so forth. The, the Chargers, we'll see what happens out of the, uh, with, the, with the Ravens, some of these other teams. And, uh, but, but I think those are the four teams that I look at and how that shakes out. You know, a lot of it really comes down to what you said, you know, injuries. I mean, if, if Tua gets hurt again or the Dolphins, anybody loses. So Josh Allen goes down, I mean, the Bills are not going to be that good. You know, right. God forbid Patrick yeah. Mahomes goes down, they're not going to be as good. <laughs> yeah. And so we'll end on a spiritual note. You know, this is a Catholic show after all. Do you feel like you have any personal patrons that you pray to when you do your work? Well, it's interesting, you know, um, the, if you, if you look, I've, I'm a enormous, and I was sort of, you're gonna, people want us to go back into ancient history or, or into, you know, back into the church's history. Uh, but I think some of these contemporary examples are really powerful. And I think Pope John Paul II uh, is, is, uh, is a great example of someone who's gone through the Canonization can't, can't process. You can't go wrong with that pick. That's a strong pick. But but it's one but it's one that I have actual memory of, right? So I grew yeah. up in the John Paul II era. And I think we only appreciate now sort of the evangelical spirit that he brought to the church at the time. He had an extraordinary communicator. And um and I think someone that also played, you know, I thought his commitment to anti communism was incredibly relevant in 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 the world. Um and the other, frankly, and this is something I'm getting more people interested in is Fulton Sheen. You know, hey, he, uh, yeah, you know, one time he had the number one, one of the top shows. He was an original television. And yeah. if you read, if you watch some of his broadcasts from the 50s and 60s, it's eerie. It's eerie. Um, the things he describes there, because they so much reflect some of the challenges we face now. So you, you come to, to one of two conclusions. Either history does repeat itself. You know, there's things that are just always true. Or this guy was really prophetic. I think it's a combination of both in that regard. So these are people you look to for inspiration because they're contemporary to me. I can, you know, feel in touch. That doesn't mean these other stories, these others are not, you know, any, any, any martyr is obviously someone that, you know, uh, and, you know, say, and, and anyone who sort of led the starting of order, like St. Ignatius and others are, are, are people that you would be very interested in. But, but, um, you know, probably the most, one of the most influential Catholics of all time, St. Thomas Aquinas, who was a all round thought leader in terms of, yeah. understanding human psychology but talk these, about a workhorse but these, too just yeah, all the stuff I mean, you put out that to this day influence a lot of our mainstream views of the sum is huge but it, it, it influences people don't even know that they're influenced right so i think all of that is stunning but by the same token for me these contempt more contemporary examples are i find in some cases to be more relevant and simply be, for me because they lived in a world that sort of resembles the world as I understand it now. And um, obviously that, you know, we'll, we'll, um, you know, we didn't have YouTube back in the 1500s. So <laughs> some of these guys were at a disadvantage. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. And we, we could talk saints all day, but I know you're a busy guy. You got to get back to work here, you know, making laws and all that. So Senator Rubio, thank you so much for joining. Really an thank honor you. to speak to you today and best of luck in the Senate. Thank you so much.